Chapter 5 Pre-Flight and Ground Operations Introduction Pre-Flight Preparation should include the overall evaluation of the 1. Pilot, experience, sleep, food and water, drugs or medications, stress, illness. 2. Aircraft, certificate slash documents, airworthiness, fuel, weight, does not exceed maximum, performance requirements, equipment. 3. Environment, weather conditions, density altitude, forecast for departure and destination airfields, route of flight, runway lengths. 4. External pressures, schedules, available alternatives, purpose of flight. Often remembered as PAVE, it is important to consider each of these factors and establish personal minimums for flying. End of page 5 to 1. Where to fly? The Weight Shift Control, WSC. Aircraft can be transported by trailer from one flying FI ELD to the next. For as many benefits as this provides, transporting the aircraft into unfamiliar territory also includes some safety and operational issues. Contact airport management to inquire about any special arrangements to be made prior to arriving by trailer, figure 5, 1. And there may be special considerations for flying WSC aircraft with other aircraft. With smaller patterns typically used by WSC aircraft, as covered in Chapter 10, Airport Traffic Patterns, airport management may want a pilot to operate over sparsely populated areas rather than the normal airplane patterns over congested areas because of the unique noise of the WSC aircraft. Figure 5, 2. Check the airport slash facility directory, a slash FD. All required airport information per Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR, Part 91 Section 103, Pre-Flight Information. Some operation examples are traffic pattern information, noise abatement procedures, no-fly zones surrounding the airport, and special accommodations that may need to be arranged for WSC aircraft. Because of the wide range of flying characteristics of the WSC aircraft, inform local pilots about some of the incidentals of the specific WSC aircraft, e.g., flying low and slow for certain configurations. The more non-WSC aircraft pilots know about WSC flight characteristics and intentions, the better they understand how to cooperate in flight. Sharing the same airspace with various aircraft categories requires pilots to know and understand the rules and understand the flight characteristics and performance limitations of the different aircraft. End of page 5 to 2. For operations at non-aircraft fields, special considerations must be evaluated. Permission is necessary to use private property as an airstrip. Locate the area on an aeronautical sectional chart to check for possible airspace violations or unusual hazards that could arise by not knowing the terrain or location. Avoid loitering around residential structures and animal enclosures because of the slow flight characteristics of WSC aircraft and distinct engine noise. While selecting a takeoff position, make certain the approach and takeoff paths are clear of other aircraft. Fences, power lines, trees, buildings, and other obstacles should not be in the immediate flight path unless the pilot is certain he or she is able to safely clear them during takeoff and landing operations. Walk the entire length of the intended takeoff and landing area prior to departure. Figure 5, 3. Look for holes, muddy spots, rocks, dips in the terrain, high grass, and other objects that can cause problems during takeoff and landing. Physically mark areas of concern with paint, flags, or cones. Uneven ground, mud, potholes, or items in fields such as rocks might not be visible from the air. Plowed rows and vegetation are larger than they appear from the air. Unfamiliar fields can make suitable landing areas for emergencies, but should not be used as intended landing areas. Extreme caution must be exercised when operating from a new FI ELD or area for the first time. Pre-flight actions a pilot must become familiar with all available information concerning the flight, including runway lengths at airport of intended use, takeoff and landing distance accounting for airport elevation and runway slope, aircraft gross weight, wind, and temperature. For a cross-country flight not in the vicinity of the takeoff slash departure airport, information must include weather reports and forecasts, fuel requirements, and alternatives available if the planned flight cannot be completed. Weather Weather is a determining factor for all flight operations. Before any flight is considered, pilots should obtain regional and local information to first determine if the predicted weather for the planned flight is safe. 
Regional weather. Understanding the overall weather in the region being flown provides an overview of conditions and how they can change during flight. Fronts, pressure systems, isobars, and the jet stream determine the weather. There are a number of information resources from which to find the regional view of weather systems, observed and predicted. Surface analysis charts show these regional systems, which are common on weather internet sites and TV broadcasts. Figure 5, 4. Review the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge for a comprehensive understanding of weather theory, reports, forecasts, and charts for weather concepts covered throughout this weather section. There are many sources for obtaining a weather briefing, such as www.aviationweather.gov, www.nws.noaa.gov, 1-800-WX-BRIEF, and a variety of internet sites that specialize in local and regional weather. End of page 5 to 3. Local conditions. In gathering weather information for a flight, obtain current and forecast conditions where flying, as well as alternate airports in case landing at the intended destination is not possible. These conditions should include wind, surface and winds aloft, moisture, stability, and pressure. Surface wind predictions and observations can be looked at with a number of internet resources. The National Weather Aviation Service provides observations, matter, and forecasts TAF, for areas with weather reporting capabilities. Winds aloft are forecast winds at higher altitudes than the surface for locations throughout the United States. Refer to the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge for an understanding of the winds and temperatures aloft tables. Winds aloft, too, are important for flight planning and safety. A typical situation during morning hours is cold air from the night settling, creating calm winds at the surface with the winds aloft, 300 to 3,000 feet, at 30 knots. As the surface begins to warm from the sun, the cold surface air starts to warm and rise, allowing the high winds from above to mix and lower to the surface. The wind shear area in between the high winds above and calm winds below is usually turbulent and can overwhelm aircraft or pilot capabilities. Therefore, it is a dangerous practice to look only at the windsock for surface winds when there could be strong winds above. Winds aloft must be evaluated for safe flight. Figure 5, 5. During initial solo flights, the wind should be relatively calm to fly safely. As experience is gained, pilot wind limitations can be increased. It is not until the pilot has had dual training in crosswinds, bumpy conditions, and significant pilot in command PIC, time soloing in mild conditions that pilot wind conditions should approach the aircraft limitations. A safe pilot understands aircraft and personal limitations. Moisture in the air has a significant effect on weather. If the relative humidity is high, the chance of clouds forming at lower altitudes is more likely. Clouds forming at lower altitudes create visibility problems that can create instrument meteorological conditions IMC, in which the visibility is below that required for safe flight. The temperature dew point spread is the basis for determining at what altitude moisture condenses in clouds form. It is important to be particularly watchful for low visibilities when the air and dew point temperatures are within a spread of 3 to 4 degrees. End of page 5 to 4. The closer these temperatures are to each other, the greater the chance for fog or clouds forming with reduced visibility conditions. Consider a scenario where the destination airport currently has a temperature dew point spread of 4 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is evening when the atmosphere is cooling down. Since the temperature dew point convergence rate is 4.4 degrees for every thousand feet, the cloud slash ceiling would be about 1,000 feet above ground level (AGL). Since it is cooling down, the temperature dew point spread is decreasing, lowering the cloud level. Therefore, the 1,000 foot AGL ceiling is lowering, creating IMC conditions that are not safe. For this scenario, the flight should not be attempted. Air temperature and humidity directly affect the performance of the WSC wing and engine. The higher the temperature, humidity, and actual altitude of the operating Phi ELD, the greater roll density altitude plays in determining how much runway the WSC aircraft needs to get off the ground with the load on board, and how much climb performance is required once airborne. The WSC aircraft may have cleared the obstacle at 8 a.m. when the weather conditions were cooler with less humidity, at 1 p.m. with increased air temperature and higher humidity levels, the pilot must re-evaluate the performance of that same aircraft. 
A full understanding of density altitude is necessary to be a safe WSC pilot, refer to the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge for density altitude and weight effects on performance. The rate of temperature decrease with increased altitude determines the stability of the air. The stability of the air determines the vertical air currents that develop during the day as the area is heated by the sun. These rising vertical air currents are commonly known as thermals. Generally, stable air has mild thermals and therefore less turbulence than unstable air. Unstable air rises faster, creating greater turbulence. Highly unstable air rises rapidly and, with enough moisture, can build into thunderstorms. Air stability is easily determined by the rate at which the temperature drops with increased altitude. A standard atmosphere is where the temperature drops 2 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 foot increase. If the temperature drops less than 2 degrees Celsius per thousand feet, the air is more stable with less vertical wind, thermals, developed during the day. If the temperature drops more than 2 degrees Celsius per thousand feet, the air is more unstable with more powerful vertical air currents developed during the day, creating greater turbulence. In addition to air stability, barometric pressure has a large effect on weather. Low pressure in the area, below the standard atmosphere of 29.92 Hg, is generally rising air with dynamic and unsettled weather. High pressure above the standard atmosphere in the area is generally sinking air resulting in good weather for flying. Many airports have automated weather systems in which pilots can call the automated weather sensor platforms that collect weather data at airports and listen to this information via radio and or landline. Radio frequencies are on the sectional chart and the A-FD has the telephone numbers for these stations. The systems currently available are the Automated Surface Observing System ASUS, Automated Weather Sensor System AWSS, and Automated Weather Observation System AWOS. Local conditions of wind, moisture, stability, and barometric pressure are factors that should be researched before flight to make a competent decision of go or no-go to fly. High winds and moist unstable air with a low barometric pressure indicate undesirable flying conditions. Light winds and dry stable air with high pressure indicate favorable flying conditions. Pilots should research and document these local conditions before flight to predict the flying conditions and compare the actual flying conditions to the predictions to learn and develop knowledge from the information resources available for flight. In addition to weather, the national airspace needs to be checked to ensure there are no temporary flight restrictions TFR, for the locations planned to fly. TFRs may be found at www.tfr.faa.gov. For a complete pre-flight briefing of weather in TFRs, call 1-800-WX-BRIEF. Clouds visually tell what the air is doing, which provides valuable information for any flight. To understand the different cloud formations and the ground-slash-air effects produced, refer to weather theory in the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge. Figure 5, 6. Cloud clearance and visibility should be maintained for the operations intended to be conducted. The chapter covering the National Airspace System in AS, provides cloud clearance requirements in each class of airspace. A pilot should not fly when ground and flight visibility are below minimums for his or her pilot certificate and the class of airspace where operating. Knowledge of mechanical turbulence and how to determine where it can occur is also important. The least side of objects can feel turbulence from the wind up to 10 times the height of the object. The stronger the wind is, the stronger the turbulence is. Figures 5, 7 and 5 to 8. In addition to adhering to the regulations and manufacturer recommendations for weather conditions, it is important to develop a set of personal minimums such as wind limitations, time of day, and temperature dew point spread. These minimums will evolve as a pilot gains experience and are also dependent on recency and currency in the make slash model of aircraft being flown. End of page 5 to 5. Figure 5, 6. Cloud Diagram. Figure 5, 7. Turbulence created by man-made items. End of page 5 to 6. Weight and loading. Weight and loading must be considered before each flight. Do not exceed the maximum gross weight as specified in the pilot's operating handbook, POH. 
The balance of the pilot, passenger, fuel, and baggage is usually not an issue, but must be reviewed in the POH for the specific make slash model since some may have balance limitations. The fore and aft carriage attachment to the wing hang point must be within the limits as specified in the POH for weight and loading of the carriage. Always follow the POH performance limitations. Transporting It is best to keep the WSC aircraft in an enclosed hangar, but trailers may be used to transport, store, and retrieve the WSC carriage. If the trailer is large enough, the wing can also fit inside the trailer. If not, then it must fit on top of a trailer, truck, or recreational vehicle, RV. Figure 5, 9. Enclosed trailers are preferred so the carriage is protected from the outside elements such as dust, rain, mud, road debris, and the interested person who may want to tinker with the carriage. The WSC carriage should fit snugly without being forced, be guarded against chafing, and well secured within any trailer. It is best to utilize hard points on the carriage frame and secure each wheel so the carriage cannot move fore and aft during transport. This is best accomplished by first tying the front wheel from the axles, the fork, or a hard point on the frame with a slight forward pull. Then, secure the rear wheels from the axles or a hard point on the frame with a slight rearward pull. Guides on the side of the wheels and wheel chocks in front and back of each wheel are additionally helpful to secure the carriage on any trailer. The wing must have ample padding and should have at least three support points where it rests for transport. Transporting the wing properly is of critical importance because the wing resting on any hard surface can wear a hole in the sail and cause structural damage to the tubing. The greatest wear and tear on a wing can occur during transportation. Each support point should have equal pressure, no single point taking most of the load. The wing should be tied down at each attachment point to secure it, but not tight enough to damage the wing. Wide straps are better than thin ropes because the greater width creates less concentrated pressure on the wing at each tie-down point. Once the loading of the carriage and wing is complete, figure 5, 9. Take a short drive, stop, and check for rubbing or chafing of components. Prior to taking the tow vehicle and trailer on the road, inspect the tires for proper inflation and adequate tread. Ensure all lights are operable, the hitch is free-moving and well lubricated, the tow vehicle attachment is rated for the weight of the trailer, and the vehicle and trailer brakes are operable. Avoid towing with too much or too little ton weight, which causes the trailer to fishtail at certain speeds, possibly rendering it uncontrollable. Be extremely cautious when unloading the wing and carriage. This is best done with two people since the wing usually weighs more than 100 pounds, figure 5, 10, and the carriage usually must roll down some incline to get from the trailer to the ground. End of page 5 to 7. Some carriages may be tail heavy without the wing, and caution must be exercised, especially moving up and down ramps. Check propeller clearance on the ground when transitioning onto or off of a ramp and propeller clearance going into and out of an enclosed trailer. If the carriage is transported in an open trailer, it should be covered and the propeller secured so it does not rotate slash windmill during transport. Setting up the WSC aircraft. Find a suitable area to set up the wing, such as grass, cement, or pavement out of the wind. Inside a large hangar is preferable since wind gusts are not a problem. If setting up outside, align the wing perpendicular to the wind. Most wings set up with the same basic procedure shown in figures 5, 11 through 5 to 33. But the POH should be referenced for the specific WSC aircraft. Rotate the wing bag so the zipper is facing up. Figure 5, 11. Unzip the bag. When setting up the wing, pay close attention to the specific pads, where they are located, and how they are attached for each component of the wing. As shown in figure 5, 12. The padding is made specifically for the control frame between the down tubes and the control bar. If every pad is not utilized when taking it down and transporting, there will be wear on components with cosmetic and or structural damage to the wing. The POH may specify where pads go during the setup and takedown. However, when setting up any wing it is a good idea to take pictures, draw sketches, or take notes regarding protective pad locations so they can be put back in the proper location during takedown. End of page 5 to 8. Assemble the triangular control frame without attaching the wires to the nose. Figure 5, 13. Rotate the wing up onto its control frame. 
Figure 5, 14. Place the front wires near the control bar so no one walks on them, remove, and roll up the cover bag. Figure 5, 15. Release the wing tie straps that are holding the leading edges together. Figure 5, 16. Spread the wing slightly. Remove the pads from the wing keel and king post. Note the protective pads still on the wing tips protecting them from the ground during most of the wing setup procedure. Figure 5, 17. Continually manage the wing pads and wing tie straps by rolling the pads into the cover bag so they do not blow away. Figure 5, 18. If the king post is loose, insert it onto the keel to stand upright. If the king post is attached, swing it upright. Topless wings have no king post. Spread the wings as necessary to keep the king post straight up, figure 5, 19. Spreading them out carefully and evenly. Do not force anything. Ensure the wires are not wrapped around anything. Separate the right and left battens. Separate the straight battens for a double surface wing and set them to the side. Lay off the battens, longest to shortest from the root to the tip next to the pocket they go into on both sides. End of page 5 to 9. Note the protective pads are still on the wing tips so they are protected. Figure 5, 20. Insert the battens into the batten pockets, starting at the root and work out to the tip. Figure 5, 21. Most batten attachments are double pull. Figure 5, 22. Some manufacturers use cord or elastic, and others use a system that slips into the sail itself. See the POH for wing details. Insert battens from the root towards the tip about three quarters the way out on each side. Leave the tip battens for later. Spread the wings as far as possible. Figure 5, 23. Check to ensure all the wires are straight, not wrapped around, and clear to tension the wing. Tension the wing by pulling back on the crossbar tensioning cable and pulling the crossbar back into position. This may require significant effort for some wings. Secure the tensioning cable to the back of the keel. Figure 5, 24. If the keel does not extend out, then support the aft end of the keel to lift the tips off of the ground. Figure 5, 25. Move to the front and secure the front control frame flying wires to the underside nose attachment. Figure 5, 26. Remove the tip bag protectors and install the tip battens, continuing to move from the root to the tips on each side. Insert the washout strut into the leading edge. Each manufacturer has its own washout strut systems and tip battens. Some manufacturers have no washout struts. Refer to the POH for wing specifics. Figure 5, 27. End of page 5 to 10. Insert bottom battens for a double surface. If inside a hangar where there is no wind, this can be done by putting the nose down, making it easier to install the lower battens. Figure 5, 28. If not already accomplished, lift up on the back of the keel and put the wing on its nose. Lower the undercarriage mast and line up the undercarriage behind the wing exactly in the middle. Move the undercarriage forward and attach the mast to the proper hang point location on the wing keel. Consult the POH for the proper hang point for desired trim, speed, and loading at this time. Attach the backup cable at this time also. Figure 5, 29. End of page 5 to 11. Lift up the nose and let the carriage roll backward until the wing is level and the control bar is in front of the front wheel of the carriage. Engage the parking brake and chalk the back of the carriage wheels. Ensure everything in the flight deck is free and clear so the wing can be lifted freely into position. Figure 5, 30. Lift the wing into position and lock the carriage mast. This position is unique to each manufacturer as some masts hinge above the flight deck. Refer to the POH for details on a specific aircraft. Figure 5, 31. Install the carriage front tube. Secure the control bar to the front tube with a bungee. Figure 5, 32. Attach any fairing or seats as required. Figure 5, 33. 
An alternate method of setting up the wing is to do so on the ground. This is not preferable because the sail is susceptible to getting dirty. However, this method could be used for setting up wings if it is windy or if recommended by a particular manufacturer. The ground method steps are the same as those in the assembly procedure except after the control bar is assembled, the wing is rolled over so the control frame is under the wing. The wing is assembled as if it were standing on its control frame. After the wing is tensioned, the nose is lifted, the control frame pulled forward, and the nose wire secured. This is not a common practice, and the POH should be reviewed for details on this method if it is allowed by the manufacturer. Taking down the WSC aircraft. Find a suitable area to take down the wing, preferably grass, cement, or pavement out of the wind. The best place is in a large hangar so no wind gusts can affect the takedown. If outside, align the wing perpendicular to the wind. End of page 5 to 12. It is important to note that during the takedown process, all protective pads must be put in the proper place so that no hardware can rub against the sail or frame during transport. The POH should specify what pads go where. Overall, pad everything along the wing keel plus the king post to prevent cosmetic and or structural damage occurring during transport. Taking down a WSC aircraft is done in the reverse order of assembly with the following additional steps provided to get the wing neatly packed and organized into the bag. After the wing is detentioned and the battens have been removed from the wing, keep the right and left battens separate for easier sorting during the next assembly. Carefully bring the wings in towards the keel and pull the sail material out and over the top of the leading edges. Lower the king post and pad it top and bottom. This is also the time to pad the area underneath where the control frame is attached to the keel and where the wires are attached to the rear of the keel. Figure 5, 34. Bring the leading edges to the keel and keep the sail pulled out over the top of the leading edge, roll it up, and tuck the sail into the leading edge stiffener. Fasten around the leading edge with sail ties. Figure 5, 35. It is best to take one sail tie and secure the two leading edges together so it fits into the bag. Figure 5, 36. Continue with the reverse order, bag on, flip wing over, and disassemble control frame at down tube and control bar junction. After the control frame is disassembled and laid flat along the wing as shown, the wires are not organized. Figure 5, 37. Pull the cables forward towards the nose and organize them so they are straight. Install the protective control frame pads and carefully zip up the bag while tucking everything in so there is no stress on the zipper. Figure 5, 38. End of page 5 to 13. Wing Tuning. Wings are designed to fly straight with a range of trim speeds determined by the manufacturer. If the wing does not fly straight or trim to the manufacturer's specifications, it must be tuned to fly properly. Any wing adjustment can change the handling and stability characteristics of the wing. Each wing is unique and the tuning procedures are unique for each wing. It is very important to follow the specific tuning procedures in the POH AFM for the specific wing. The following are general guidelines to understand the tuning process. Tuning the wing to fly straight. Wings may turn to the right or left, depending on which way the propeller turns, at high power settings because of the turning effect described earlier in the aerodynamics section. If it does not fly straight for cruising flight, visually examine for any asymmetric right and left features on the wing before making any adjustments. Look for symmetry in the twist angle. Inspect the leading edge for any discontinuities, bumps, or an irregular leading edge stiffener. Ensure the pockets are zippered and symmetrical on both sides. Ensure the reflex lines are clear, straight, and routed properly. Check the battens to ensure the right and left match, do not make any adjustments in the battens initially because reflex may have been added at the factory initially for tuning, and ensure the battens match the manufacturer's batten pattern. Check the batten tension on both sides and the leading edge tension to ensure it is symmetrical. If it is a used wing just acquired, research the history of the wing to see what might have happened which would cause it to not fly straight. For new wings, contact the manufacturer for advice. If these checks do not make the wing fly straight, then adjust the twist in the wing according to the manufacturer's instructions. More twist on one side decreases angle of attack, produces less lift, and will drop the wing, 
which makes it turn in the direction where more twist was added. For example, with an unwanted left hand turn, either decrease the twist on the left hand wing, increase angle of attack at the tip, or increase the twist on the right hand wing, decrease the angle of attack at the tip. Batten tension is one way of fixing very mild turns. Increasing the batten tension at the tips especially decreases twist and raises the wing. For normal mild turns, most wings have an adjustment at the tip where you can rotate the wing tip around the leading edge. This is the easiest and most effective wing twist adjustment. Figure 5, 39. For some models, reflex at the root can be adjusted on a side to adjust a significant turn. More reflex on a side means wing up, similar to reducing twist in a wing. As emphasized above, the POH for each manufacturer must be used for adjusting twist for wing tuning. Adjusting the tension on the leading edge is another method of adjusting the wing twist. However, different wings will react differently when tension is adjusted, so the POH must be followed for a particular wing. Some manufacturers do not suggest adjusting sail tension to adjust twist, but require equal tension with other adjustments to remedy an unwanted turn. For those wings utilizing asymmetrical sail tension to adjust twist, the following information is provided. Adjusting sail tension is most effective on slower wings with lots of twist. Adjusting sail tension affects some high-performance wings differently, making it necessary to consult the POH. However, on most wings, increasing sail tension at the tip increases leading edge flex, resulting in more twist. Tuning the wing to fly slower or faster. Most wings allow the hang point attachment to move forward to increase trim speed and back to decrease trim speed. If there is a situation where the hang point is at the most forward position and the wing trims below the manufacturer recommended speed, or the trim speed is within 10 miles per hour (MPH) of the stall speed, an alternate method for increasing the trim speed is needed. End of page 5 to 14. For this situation, the twist must be reduced symmetrically to increase the angle of attack on the tips so they provide more lift and lower the nose for proper trim. This can be done by pulling back more on the cross-tube tensioning cables which reduces the twist in the wing. However, this procedure reduces the stability of the wing and decreases the handling ability of the wing because it is stiffer. This is a common adjustment for hanged lighting wings for in-flight trim, however this adjustment should only be made on WSC wings as specified in the POH for a specific wing. Raising and lowering the reflex lines affects airfoil reflex and also changes the trim speed of the wing. Lower reflex lines speed the wing up and make it less stable, raising the reflex line slows the wing and make it more stable. Some manufacturers have this as an adjustable setting which can be varied during flight, other manufacturers have this adjustment where it can be made on the ground. Other manufacturers do not recommend this adjustment because it can lower the certified stability of the wing. Pre-flight inspection Each aircraft must have a routine pre-flight inspection before flight. Use a written checklist during pre-flight and ground operations to maintain an established procedure. Figure 5, 40 A written checklist is required so nothing is forgotten. Ground checklists include pre-flight preparation, pre-flight inspection, occupant pre-flight brief, flight deck management, startup, taxi, before takeoff, and aircraft shutdown. Be smart and follow the regulations, use a written checklist. All checklists should be secured so they do not fly out of the flight deck in flight and hit the propeller. Securing with zippered pockets and having lanyards for the checklists is recommended. Manufacturers of Special Light Sport Aircraft SLSA, have checklists that come with the aircraft. Pilots with an experimental aircraft may need to develop their own. Certificates and Documents the first step of pre-flight inspection is to ensure the aircraft is legally airworthy which is determined in part by the following certificates and documents. 1. Airworthiness Certificate 2. Registration Certificate 3. Operating Limitations, which may be in the form of an FAA-approved AFM-POH, placards, instrument markings, or any combination thereof. 4. Weight and Balance Arrow is the acronym commonly used to remember these items. The PIC is responsible for making sure the proper documentation is on board the aircraft when operated. Figure 5, 41 Aircraft logbooks are not required to be on board when it is operated. 
However, inspect the aircraft logbooks prior to flight to confirm the WSC aircraft has had all required inspections. The owner slash operator must keep maintenance records for the airframe and power plant. At a minimum, there must be an annual condition inspection within the preceding 12 calendar months. In addition, the WSC aircraft may also need a 100-hour inspection in accordance with 14 CFR Part 91 if it is used for hire, e.g., for training operations. Figure 5, 42. If a transponder system is used, the transponder must be inspected within each preceding 24 calendar months. End of page 5 to 15. The pilot must have in his or her possession a sport pilot certificate for the aircraft being flown, medical eligibility, and a government-issued photo identification. For a sport pilot certificate, medical eligibility can be a valid United States driver's license, which also serves as government-issued photo identification. To fly the aircraft with private pilot privileges, the pilot needs a valid FAA minimum third-class medical certificate accompanied by a government-issued photo identification and private pilot certificate for WSC aircraft. See Chapter 1, Introduction to Weight Shift Control, for details on specific pilot certificates and privileges. Routine Pre-Flight Inspection the accomplishment of a safe flight begins with a careful and systematic routine pre-flight inspection to determine if the aircraft is in a condition for safe flight. The pre-flight inspection should be performed in accordance with a printed checklist provided by the manufacturer for the specific model of the aircraft. However, the following general areas are applicable to all WSC aircraft. The pre-flight inspection begins as soon as a pilot approaches the aircraft. Since the WSC aircraft can be transported by trailer, first and foremost, look for any damage that may have occurred during takedown, loading, transit, unloading, and setup. Make note of the general appearance of the aircraft, looking for obvious discrepancies such as tires with low air pressure, structural distortion, wear points, and dripping fuel or oil leaks. All tie-downs, control locks, and shocks should be removed during the unloading process. The pilot must be thoroughly familiar with the locations and functions of the aircraft systems, switches, and controls. Use the pre-flight inspection as an orientation when operating a particular model for the first time. The actual walk-around routine pre-flight inspection has been used for years from the smallest general aviation airplane to the largest commercial jet. The walk-around is thorough and systematic, and should be done the same way each time an aircraft is flown. In addition to seeing the aircraft up close, it requires taking the appropriate action whenever a discrepancy is discovered. A WSC aircraft walk-around covers four main tasks. 1. Wing inspection. 2. Carriage inspection. 3. Power plant inspection. 4. Equipment check. Throughout the inspection, check for proper operation of systems, secure nuts slash bolts slash attachments slash hardware, Look for any signs of deterioration or deformation of any components slash systems, such as dents, signs of excessive wear, bending, tears, or misalignment of any components and or cracks. End of page 5 to 16.